very good afternoon to you all. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Arlet and Tuana. Professor Lian Zela, Head, Department of Economics. Professor Sanjoy Hazarika, Ms. Priti Gill from CNES New Delhi. Senior faculties, faculty from Mizoram University. Special invitees and dear students. It is indeed a very proud privilege for the Department of Economics to be able to organize this auspicious program today. At the very outset, I would like to thank our Vice Chancellor for sparing his valuable time uh, to grace this function as a chief guest. Our thanks also goes to heads of uh, various departments of Mizoram University whose students are here to participate in our program today. And we are exceedingly grateful to all the special invitees and all the VIPs, very interested persons, who are here in our midst today. I would like to make one small opening remark, that is, see, events of the past should, uh, instead of being something to disregard, should be studied and uh, carefully analyzed. Because future disastrous events can be avoided by the knowledge that we gain from prior events. In this regard, let me quote uh, George Santayanu. He who refuses to learn the past is doomed to repeat it. With that remark, may I invite Mr. Chu Chok uh, Sering from Harwich Ball to deliver a speech. Thank you. A very warm good afternoon, respected uh, Vice Chancellor of the Mizoram University, Professor R. Lal Thorn Unger, uh, dear faculties and dear students of Mizoram University. I, on behalf of Heinrich Paul Stiftung, would like to welcome you all for the screening of today's uh, documentary film titled uh, Ram Boy, Mizoram's uh, Trouble Years. Before I start, uh, I, I'll just give you a brief introduction of my office, which is based in New Delhi. Heinrich Paul Stiftung is a German Green Political Foundation, and uh, it is headquartered in Berlin, in Germany. And we have around uh, 30 international offices, uh, and Heinrich Paul understands itself as a green think tank or international agency network which works on various issues on ecology, gender equity, sustainable development, democracy, and human rights issues. Therefore, Heinrich Paul Stiftung is also present in India since 2002, and our office is based in New Delhi, uh, coordinating with different uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations focusing on gender equity and socio-economic policies. And in New Delhi, we have uh, four major areas of work uh, which we are dealing with for last uh, 10, 15 years. And these are resource governance and climate issue, ecology, gender and socio-economic policies, and democracy and dialogue and human rights issues in India. So out of which these four programs, one of the major focuses of our democracy and dialogue program is the focus of Northeast issue and to promote better understanding of Northeast to the so-called mainland India and also to initiate uh, regional dialogues on different issues on human rights, democracy, and sustainable development. And in this capacity, for the last 10, 15 years, we have organized and arranged lots of uh, many conferences, workshops, conducted uh, field research and tr uh, training programs. And today's documentary film uh, titled uh, Ram Boy, uh, Trouble Years of Mizoram is made by Professor Sanjay Hazarika of Center for Northeast Studies, New Delhi, and Miss Preeti Gill, which is a product of last uh, two years of their uh, hard work. 
and we had the privilege of screening this documentary in presence of the Honorable Chief Minister of Mizoram yesterday at uh, DIPR Auditorium at Aizul. And we will be screening this documentary uh, film in different cities in next two, three months in uh, India. So without taking much time, I also would like to thank Professor uh, Margaret Cho Zama and uh, Prof uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. C. Lal Om Puya Wanchao for reviewing and uh, compiling different literatures on Mizo history, especially the uh, crucial areas, eras of 1960s and 70s, which we will be releasing shortly. I would also like to thank Professor Lian Zela of uh, head, head of Department of uh, Economics, Mizoram University, and Dr. Lai Poi of Economic De Department, and also whole faculty and students of Department of Economics for organizing this uh, program today. With this, uh, I would like to invite uh, our honorable chief guest, uh, Vice Chancellor Professor R. Lal Thonga to come on the dice. I would also like to invite Professor Sanjo Hazarka, Professor Margaret Cho Zama, <laughs> Professor Len Zela, and Miss Priti Gill to come on the dance. Now I would like to invite uh, Mefus Center for Northeast Studies to felicitate our Chief Guest Honorable Vice Chancellor of Mizoram University. <laughs> Professor Len Zela of the uh, Department of Economics. Uh, Professor Margaret Zama of Department of English and Dr. Lai Poi of Department of Economics. I now would like to invite Honorable Vice Chancellor and other guests to release and launch the book by Professor Margaret Cho Zama of uh, Department of English in Mizoram University and Dr. C. Lal Ompuya Wanchao's book named uh, After Decades of Silence Voices from Mizoram. This book is a compilation and review of different literatures on uh, history of Mizoram in contemporary uh, era, especially in 1960s, 70s. And this is product of uh, Professor Mar uh, Margaret and uh, Dr. Wan Chao for last six, seven months. Thank you. Uh, uh, Now I would like to invite Honorable Vice Chancellor to give his uh, remarks for today's program. Uh, 
good afternoon, all of you. Professor Lianzela, Head of Economics Department, Zoram University. Professor Sanzai Azarika. And uh, Mrs. Pretty Gil, Professor Margaret Zama, and Mr. Lalampuya, my colleagues in the university, my dear student friends, special invitees, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, a great honor for me, as well as for the university, that this uh, film Ramboy is uh, screened here today for the benefit of all of us, particularly for the students. And it is now 50 years since the uh, this Ramboy, which was started in, we started in 1966. I know many of uh, the students who are here today were not yet born during those uh, initial years of this Ramboy. And I think many of you may not know also the details of this uh, Ramboy. And I am happy that Professor Hazarika, I mean Sanjay Hazarika and Pretty Gil have made this film. It will be a very good documentary for all of us and also for the generations to come. As uh, Dr. Lap, we have said, I think many things will have to be learned, even for those who have not experienced this Ramboy from this documentary. At that time, in 1966, Mizoram was part of the Den Assam, one of the districts of Assam. So it is good that Professor Sanjay Arika, who is from initially from Assam, has taken pains to make this documentary, I'm sure, whatever he has done will be very authentic. And also, I would like to congratulate both of them and also Professor Margaret Zama and <coughs> Dr. C. Lalompuya for making this, uh, preparing this uh, book they, at least Professor Margaret Zama, must have experienced all these uh, trouble years because I know she must have been around 10 years or so when in 1966, so she has the uh, personal experience. Not only that, she was uh, from Mizoram, she is the daughter of uh, the then uh, political leader of Mizoram, Putso Tsunga, in 1966, I think he was the, perhaps the chief executive uh, member. At that time, it was a district. So he was chief executive member, and later on, he also became the first uh, chief minister of Mizoram. So apart from general experience, she must have uh, even some special experiences 
and also must be knowing many things which uh, many of us do not know. As far as I am concerned, since I was most of the time outside Mizoram after around 64 or 65 studying outside Mizoram and also later on working in Mizoram, I did not have much of the personal experience which many of the, our Mizo people at that time had. But the February, March, uh, the start of this uh, Ramboy was just before our final year BSc examination. So it was uh, uh, a shock for us because we are preparing for the examination and uh, when we heard of this, we are very much emotionally disturbed. Somehow we could uh, finish our exam. And since the problem was so much at that time, transport problem, conveyance problem, people advised us not to come to Mizoram. So I stayed on waiting for my result in uh, Silong itself. And when our results was out, I since I was so interested to pursue my uh, further studies, so I approached the then Chief Minister of uh, uh, Assam, Pu BP Saliha, for some financial help so that I can continue my studies. So he gave me 120 rupees at that time. So with that, I went down to Maharashtra and joined my MSc. But in that very same year, in the autumn of 1966, I heard the news that my village, which is uh, not Serzol, was banned by the forces. So many people died in that incident when there was an uh, exchange of fire between the armed forces and the MNA volunteers. So I was also at that time very much uh, uh, emotionally very disturbed. And since my parents did not have a house to stay, so they moved to Aizol. And since then, we have settled in Aizol. Had it not been due to that, Maybe I'll still be in the remote village of uh, Mizoram. After that, I sometimes came to Aizol on my holidays. I had some experiences, but I'll not tell all those. Uh, and I had so many hardships which our people have uh, suffered during those uh, years. It is now uh, very good that the peace has uh, been restored in Mizoram and it become one of the most peaceful states in the country. And we thank all those who work for this peace and uh, those who have uh, ended the sufferings and miseries of the people of Mizoram. And as far as uh, this uh, documentary and this uh, uh, collection of information is concerned, I am sure since a uh, lot of time has passed, the information they have in this film as well as in this book are properly checked, so I'm sure they will be very reliable. So this will be a very good source of information, even for those who are uh, trying to do research and write books and even make documentaries in the future. 
and I'm sure our students, the younger generation, will learn from all this and also uh, learn the uh, find out the uh, the that peace and tranquility is very valuable and we all will work for that even in for Mizoram, for India and for uh, the whole world in these days of uh, uh, trouble. So I hope this will uh, encourage us to work for peace uh, wherever we are. So I thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to be uh, in this uh, uh, screening and also in this release of this book. So I'll not take much of our time. I'm sure you are all looking forward to uh, see this uh, film. So I uh, hope that we all enjoy this uh, film. So thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Vice Chancellor, for sharing his hardships and experiences he had faced during uh, troubled years of Mizoram. I now would like to invite Professor Margaret Cho Zama to speak something about the book. Thank you, Cho. Uh, <coughs> Honorable Chief Guest, our Vice Chancellor. Uzela and Priti and Sanjoy and of course all our senior colleagues and our students, friends and special invitees. I'm privileged to stand here uh, but I will be very brief because the best has been saved for the last. So my remarks are going to be few but uh, I hope I have your attention because I feel that what I have to say also will be crucial. Uh, Preeti Gill will be giving an introduction of herself and Sanjoy, which I think is very important because I think most of us sitting out here may not know who they are or, uh, you know, what uh, they have come for. But apart from that, I will just speak very briefly on the book. This is an 85-page little volume, which has not been priced as yet and therefore is not on sale. It is part of the project, the first part of the project, which has been titled After Decades of Silence, Voices from Mizoram, A Brief Review of Mizo Literature. That is what it is. Uh, it will be fleshed out at a later, later date and put up for sale. So for now, uh, it, it has been released because it is part of the project. Uh, this work would not have been possible. We had exactly six months to work on it. So I had the help of a junior research fellow, Dr. C. Lal Ompuya. Uh, many of us may not be too familiar with him, but he has been, he I think is, as I keep saying, one of the few serious research scholars on Rambuai literature. Uh, he has been working at it for the past five, six years, and he recently, last year, he published a substantial book called Rambuai Literature, for which I had written, uh, you know, the introduction for him. Now, regarding this book, it's not uh, in the usual history kind of format because we have gone genre-wise, and this is uh, re uh, a review, as it were, and the purpose of this book is to actually show how the Mizo creative mind and creative writers and also writers of nonfiction have, uh, you know, come up from the early days. Once we got our script, the value of our oral literature, the value of our oral uh, traditions and orators, we move on to the decades that come after we got our script. And what we have done, how we have tried to work on this book is, 
we have tried to show how through the years the different kinds of literary trends that came as the decades moved on, the choice of theme and subject matter of works of both creative writers and uh, non-fiction writers, poets, song composers, which reflects the growth of the miso mind towards modernity and towards the contemporary miso. So the formation of our identity also, hopefully, is what has been one of the key focus of this book. How we have actually, uh, because as the write-up for this uh, project already had already stated also, a people, the growth of a people's mind is seen in the literature that they produce. And the literature that we have produced, the kind of themes, the kind of topics, the kind of style with which we write, has been traced in this book. So that it shows how the miso from the old days and the old way of life came up through modernization and to the contemporary times. So we have tried to cover, there will be several names here, uh, it being a very brief review, uh, which have not found space, and yet many, many new writers, many, many new names, which have found space here, because they, we feel, are the ones who have been come up, coming up with some new trends. Now we have, uh, the part three of this book has been focused on the Rambuai period, that is the Rambuai literature, uh, which may not be much in terms of corpus at that time, but which is coming up today. But at that point in time, there were a number of song compositions, a number of uh, you know uh, works that were coming up, but which could not be published or which were not published at that time, as our book tells, because of the lack of proper printing press. We used to have cyclo style. I remember also, you know, uh, the materials that were going around at that point in time were in cyclo style sheets and so on and so forth. Now today with good printing press and with uh, you know uh, communication revolution that we have thanks to the internet facility and the computer and our press, our offset press, we have several of them now. So the publishing world also has made strides. So literature of the miso and miso writing in English has a bright future. Now, one thing I want to say uh, very briefly is Priti, of course, will be talking, and Hazarika, uh, uh, Sanjoy Hazarika also will be talking. Uh, many people, uh, they have a question in their mind. When people talk about Ramboy, why do we talk about Ramboy? Why do we want to uh, relive or bring out memories? Can't we let it rest? It is so full of sadness, so full of conflict, so full of violence. So many of us have experienced it. So people think that uh, what actually is the purpose of this? Well, in my book, in my book meaning not in this book, but the way I see it, it's very important for us, especially young people who are gathered today, to know about the formation of our history. This dark spot in our history, which, as the Vice Chancellor pointed out, is exactly 50 years old, and 30 years old since the uh, peace treaty was signed, the peace accord. It's a recent part in our history, but it is something that many youngsters do not know about. So it's very important that we listen to the voices when we listen to the screening. These are collection of voices. Now, the voices are not making any judgment on anyone, but it is these voices that are going to be part of uh, the contribution to the formation of the history that will be written by our historians, our social scientists in the days to come. So we have to know the different uh, parameters, the different sides of the picture, and this is what we are going to get in the uh, screening today. So I feel that, you know, our history must not be uh, lopsided 
It must not be captured or it must not be monopolized by any group. So all of us must be able to see what happened in those times and also be able to come up with a fair picture. And this is why I feel this project was very important and I agreed to be part of it. Uh, I also want to thank Professor R. Thang Wunga, who is a very good close colleague of us from the Department of Mizo, who helped to translate the two Siam uh, Suk Kan La, the two songs of the burning of the village of Siam Suk, uh, which I conveyed to, uh, which I gave to uh, Usan Joy because he requested me. And you will see, as we see the screening, the ladies of Siam Suk will be singing this in the backdrop and uh, you know to give it that atmosphere of what was actually happening at that time so please uh, dear students you are all young people who don't really have an idea of what happened it's so it's important today that we all start uh, taking a look seriously at our own history that we are able to see things from many lenses and not just from one or two lenses all right Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Margaret, for giving the detailed information of the book. Uh, I now would like to invite Professor Sanjo Hazarka to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Preeti Gill and would like to request uh, uh, Preeti Gill to introduce the project. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, Preeti Gill is uh, a publisher, an editor, and now a literary agent. Uh, she started her career uh, with Prentice Hall of India, then worked as an editor with the Book Review, and with two feminist presses, the uh, Kali for Women, and uh, more recently with Zuban. Uh, we have worked together uh, at Zuban. She was the international uh, rights director for authors that Zuban published, uh, international rights across the world. Uh, we have worked together for about 20 years on different projects, including films on the Brahmaputra, uh, and this most recent one on, on the Rumbai. Uh, as a literary agent, and there are only uh, a handful of them in India, uh, and as editor of uh, an editor at Zuban, she has been responsible for bringing the literature, the writing, fiction and non-fiction, particularly non-fiction, uh, particularly fiction, uh, to great large publishers across the country. Uh, and one of her authors as literary agent, uh, Isra Kire, won the Hindu Literary Award last year, another one is shortlisted for another major award this year. So it's a delight uh, to have her. She's a friend, colleague, and a great support. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's a wonderful introduction. Um, of course, I've known Sanjoy for years and years, as he said. Uh, he's um, been a friend and a mentor because, of course, I do not belong to the Northeast, but I've been traveling around here for the last 20, 22 years now. And I feel that I know a little bit about the different communities, the different histories, the different stories that exist here. And I've been privileged to be able to bring them to the um, so-called Indian mainland. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here at the university today, and I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor and the Department of Economics for having made all this possible. And I'm grateful for all the faculty members and all the students who are here, especially the students who are here, uh, because uh, I think this was really a, a very important uh, project that we had taken on, and uh, Margaret has already specified why it was so important. The project uh, was, uh, was called um, um, After Decades of Silence. Uh, and the thing is that I think around three to four years ago at a seminar that I attended, uh, it was at that point that I first heard that there was a silencing of voices and of stories of a certain period in Mizo history, which uh, the rest of the country certainly had no idea about. 
And that is what sparked off this interest in trying to come here and to find out and to be able to bring out these stories. And um, starting from there, uh, with the support of the Bowl Foundation, we managed to do this project, which was in two parts. The first being six months in which Margaret and her colleagues had to put together a review of published uh, literature in Miso, uh, in Miso and in English. And uh, that the result is this uh, book that you see. Uh, it's a seminal book. It's the beginning and it's the sort of cornerstone of hopefully a lot more research that will be done on some of these topics. Some of these uh, books that have been, that she's got listed over here and a lot of the genres that she has uh, mentioned, including the Rumbai. Um, the other thing that uh, came out of this, of course, is this film. And uh, the filming and the interviews that have been done for the film have been going on for the last one and a half years, where we've traveled fairly extensively uh, to different parts of Mizoram, uh, urban as well as rural, and tried to get in as many voices as we possibly could. Uh, when you see the film, you'll get an idea of uh, the kinds of uh, uh, texts and subtexts that exist. Uh, we are not trying to make any judgments. We are not really trying to answer any questions. There are a lot of questions. But what we are trying to do is also to tell the story outside. So while all of you probably know a little bit or a, more than a little bit about what happened during those 20 years, the world outside really doesn't know. The strange thing for me was that I've got daughters in college and in, you know, now finished college and doing PhDs and all, and they had no idea. And so from that I gauged that most of India has no clue about what happened. And I think to my mind that this is one of the few instances or probably the only instance, at least in this country, it is the only instance when a government has bombed its own people. And that to me seems like the most horrendous atrocity ever. And something that needs to be talked about and needs to be debated and discussed. I've been an editor and I've been in publishing for 100 years. And so uh, it's, it's always been an endeavor to try and bring voices from the so-called margins, from people and places that have not been looked at before. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be able to you know, travel to places where others may not have gone and to find writers and do translations of, of work that has not earlier featured on lists of mainstream publishers in Delhi and other places. Um, as Sanjay mentioned, I'm a literary agent now. And uh, in India, we have about five or six agents. What the agent is supposed to do is to get a book from the publisher or from, from uh, an author and try and place it with the publisher. So that's supposed to be my job. But what gives me the most pleasure is when I find something that the market, I think, needs or that people need to read about or to, or to talk about. And I'm actually able to ideate and actually able to inspire somebody to do that writing or to make that book. And I hope that we will get a book out of Mizoram to tell the story of Mizoram, because obviously the film is only 45 minutes. And in 45 minutes, we've tried to encapsulate a huge, huge amount of material. But it's the book which will do justice to the entire story. And I hope somebody here will come up and say that I want to write that book. I will be your agent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Preeti Gill. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor Len Ziala, uh, Head of Department of Economics, Mizoram University, to give his remarks for today's program. Honorable Vice Chancellor, <laughs> Professor Sanjoy, Professor Margaret, and Professor, I mean, Ms. Preeti, and my dear colleagues, and my dear students, friends. It's a pleasant surprise for me to stand before you today. Even though the Department of Economics is organizing this meeting, since the program got frequently changed, I never knew that I had to stand before you today, but it's a pleasant surprise. I'm really happy to stand before you on this very auspicious occasion. And first of all, I would like to thank the students who responded our invitation. Because at the beginning, we expect to have around 500 students 
But now this hole, if it is packed to the maximum, it can accommodate 870. It's almost packed to the maximum. So it's beyond our expectation. We are very, very happy uh, to see all the beautiful faces of our students and the teachers. And today, I would like to congratulate Sanjay and his team for completing their hard work. It's not easy to write a book, and it's not at all easy to make a film, a documentary film. So they are working very, very hard, and today that screening of the film could be done today, and I give big congratulations to Professor Sanjoy and his colleague. I had long association with Professor Sanjoy. I think during the 90s, there in India International Center, there was a seminar about uh, this Ramboy, the road to peace in Mizoram. It's rather uh, the road to peace in Mizoram. And I presented a paper on behalf of the Mizoram uh, Mizor people, and the other is Dr. Rindiki. I also would like to give my big congratulation to Professor Ma Maggie Margaret and her student for this book. We had quite a number of literatures about Rambuai in our own vernacular language in Mizo. But the literature in English about Rambuai disturbance or insurgency in Mizoram is very, very scanty and with all their hard work. We are really fortunate, the present generation, the present students, from the book, we can learn many things which we do not know at the beginning. Because as Honorable Vice Chancellor has already mentioned, it, is, it has already been 50 years since disturbance broke out, Rambuai broke out. And many of us didn't know our own history there was uh, one foreign lady, perhaps from USA. Her name is Denise Segor. She, in her dissertation, she selected a topic, uh, disturbance in Mizoram, from the understanding of women, from women's perspective. That was a doctoral thesis, and then other than that, we didn't have much uh, book for disturbance in Mizoram from which we can learn. Learning through hearing is good, but more effective is learning from seeing or learning through seeing. So today we have the book as well as the documentary film. That would tell us the history of those days because there is a saying, history repeats itself. So if we are to avoid some unwanted things, then we have to be very careful to study the situation in those days. And if we want to improve the things that happened in the past, then we have to know the story. Since today is the day when we kind of recollect our memory of the disturbance, I would like to share only three things which haunted me again and again, the story of the Rambuai. First, I would like to tell you the day when jet fighter came and struck the city of Iso. I was studying class eight when the disturbance broke out. One day, I sat with my friend. Then we had the sound of jet fighter coming, and we never expected that there would be a gunfire from the air and this thing. And then we saw two jet fighters hovering around, and then the two jet fighters, you know, shot fire or struck the city of Isol. It got burn. All of a sudden, we rushed down and then rushed to the jungle to hide ourselves. So that was the day. I mean, the first thing that I'd like to tell you my experience of Rambuai. And. Uh. You're supposed to applaud. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge everyone's presence today. But I'm going to read out a list of names.
of people who were critical to the making of the film. I will probably pronounce some of them incorrectly. Many of them are not here, but I want to acknowledge their, uh, their presence. But before that, having thanked the Vice Chancellor, I would also thank him for suspending classes to enable such a wonderful turnout and deeply appreciate that. I'm sure the students also appreciate that. Uh, Professor Lienzela for and his wonderful team for making this event so memorable for all of us. Truly, thank you. Uh, my uh, dear friend Van Lau Chana sitting in the front row deeply appreciate his constant support. You know, uh, I'd like to appreciate the, uh, yesterday we launched the film uh, at the premiere in the presence of the Chief Minister who spoke. Uh, so I'd like to thank him and the others I would like to remember are Mr. Lal, sorry. I was going to say switch off your phones and I forgot to switch off my, sorry, my apologies. So that's something you need to do, switch off your frames, put them on silent. Um, Kulan Sangliana and the family of Brigadier T. Silo, my good friend L.R. Silo who is sitting here, uh, press advisor to the Chief Minister, General V.P. Malik, former Chief of Army Staff, Brigadier B.S. Gill of the Jat Regiment, uh, Professor J.V. Luna, Rini Tochwang, Mr. Denguna, Mr. Lal Khama, the former Chief Secretary, Mr. Wang Lan Niang, former Intelligence Chief of the MNF, uh, the former Finance Secretary of the MNF, Mr. Lal Khan Liana, uh, Joy Pachal, uh, of course, Margaret Zama, and her mother, Mrs. Isabel Rutangi, Professor Tan Gung, Tan, Tan Gungna, uh, Pratap Chetri and the DIPR team, including David uh, Tangliana, uh, the women singers of Sialsuk and the villagers of Sialsuk, uh, Professor H.L. Landin uh, Ray Fente, um, uh, Reverend C.L. Menga, Dr. Lal Thanmoy, the YMA, the MZP, uh, the Misa Upapal, the Misa Women's Association, and Dr. Ail Silo of Pachunga College, officers of Assam Rifles, Aizor, Dennis Ralte of Floria Hotel, and there are too many perhaps to name, but one person and his uh, team I would like to acknowledge is Mapu Chongte, uh, the filmmaker from Dungle who sent his assistant and the high uh, definition projector on which the film will be screened uh, all the way from Lungle and we're having a screening tomorrow in Lungle. Uh, my actual director, uh, Molly Senapati, Vikash Dutta, the editor, Hidden Thakuria, the camera person, uh, as well as I'd like to recognize uh, Mefuz if he's here somewhere. If you're here, please stand up. Mefuz from our center's office in in uh, Delhi, who's done all the running around and coordinating here with uh, Dr. Lapui. Um, so I'm deeply grateful for all that is done. What we must make sure is that the voices which are silenced continue to speak out, and these no longer become Mizoram's forgotten years. What you have heard from uh, the Vice Chancellor, thank you for sharing what must have been very difficult to share, and I know that story we were getting beaten. Uh, but everyone has a story. You speak to your grandparents, your parents, everyone has a story. And it is an effort to tell that story uh, that has led to this book. Uh, because 50 years ago, something terrible happened here. And 30 years ago, a period of healing began. So this is really a tribute to everyone in Mizoram at the time who lived through that period. Who, and we put the, tried to put the Mizo story 
in the voices of Mizo people, the people of Mizoram, and those whom they encounter. It's taken us uh, well over a year in filming it, and the roads of Mizoram know us very well, and our bodies, our backs also know the roads of Mizoram very well. We hope they will improve, both will improve in the years to come. Uh, but I would uh, like you to watch the film now, and I would request you to switch your phones off, or put them on silent, and uh, please uh, stay until the film is over. Uh, we will take questions and comments after the film, and just to make sure you don't rush away after it, there will also be tea. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce Lombard. Any comments or can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Any comments or questions, we'll be very happy to respond to them. Yeah, could you just identify yourself in the department? Hello? Good afternoon, sir. Sir Sanjoy Haraji Hazarikayan, Miss Petigil. I am from the Department of Education. And I would like to ask this question regarding some something that is closely related to of uh, a certain period. And the thing I'd like to raise is uh, during that in the time of insurgency there were many victims, especially women were the, the worst victims. And, and some of them were dead and they were gone. Let that be, let, I got to be bygone, but now I would like to ask a question uh, that is, is there any, is there any relief or compensatory skills for the victims, especially for women, uh, those who were just uh, facing like uh, rapings? Is there any rally for compensatory skills for the government, central government? It's my question. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, there has been uh, virtually no relief and very little compensation which has been given. Uh, because, um, you know, it was an age of impunity and injustice. And that's why some of us are also opposed to the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, because that act enables all those things to happen. And you don't get justice, and the attackers are protected. Um, I know only two cases of, of, of rape where the victims are compensated. Um, I don't recall the village. But in that, in those two cases, the they went men, they became uh, men after the incident. So that is one particular incident that I know of. But there are many other issues of torture and violence on men as well. Who, people who I personally know who are attacked, abused, uh, tortured, and their fathers and relatives. So. Justice has not been done, and I think the government needs to start with an apology, the government of India, for what happened with the bombing to start. So, and this is something I actually said in public to the army uh, in one of their main uh, training centers in central India. Of course, the reaction was. The reaction was mixed. Some people actually thought it would be a good thing to do. Other people were reacted because they said it's not the army's responsibility. I said the government needs to apologize because the government sent the army. So you must understand also that the that AFSPA remains in place in Nagaland, Manipur, and in Assam. Tripura last year removed it. Mizoram has publicly gone on record, and yesterday the Chief Minister made this very clear, 
will never, never, never use it again. It's a very brutal law. And I urge all of you to study what AFSWA is about and what it's done to people in this region, not just uh, here, but also Punjab and Kashmir. Sorry. Okay, thank you. My name is Professor Ravi. It's working. Oh, thank you. Uh, I do not have uh, so many questions to raise, but I want to pass my comments. First of all, uh, I really praise two, uh, two military officers, Malik and Gills, for speaking out the truth from my point of view. Because though I was very young, I was, uh, I was in the place, and my knowledge about this agency is still clear today. And I can uh, I, I still recollect the time when our house was set on fire, then I was one of the boys who was basically waiting for the time when I should be asked by my parents to go away. Then I was our house being set on fire from the veranda of the church. I remember that time. But today, I'm not going to rake up all those things, but uh, I am very glad that the two, the two officers has to have spoken out the truth with regards to their own experience. That's why many of the questions that I should raise have also been withdrawn by me. Because the, those two people, those two officials, from my point of view, have spoken out the truth. Thank you much for that. But here, uh, like, I uh, have only one small question. I don't know whether it, it will be valid or not. Now, it is the, this is the place where the national government ha had dropped a bomb on its own people. Is any other place in India where government of India had decided that another bomb should be dropped or has the bomb been dropped without our knowledge somewhere else in, in India? Thank you. No, as far as I know, this is the only incident, and uh, hopefully it will be the first, last. It should have never have happened. It's happened. And as uh, Rad Sangliana says, you know, out of desperation, because they thought, you know, just think of it, this whole state, then the district of Assam, the whole state was in the hands of the MNF. The entire state, except one little pocket that many of you see every day on your way to work or office or home, which is the top part of the Assam Rifles. Only that was in the hands of the government. All India Radio had fallen, the district uh, headquarters had fallen, everything had gone. All the police outposts, Assam Rifles outposts had been overrun. And there were 30,000 people in that movement at that time, okay? With or without arms. That's an army. So I'm, seeing, I'm pretty sure the government of India was very scared that the whole uh, area would secede and become, declare independence, raise its flag, and then be recognized by uh, other countries. So this seemed to be, in my view, an act of desperation. It should never have happened, but it did. And also that you should actually start looking at all the other places as well. Don't confine yourself only to your own state and to your own people. Look elsewhere as well. So the film is about Mizoram right now, but there's so much else going on in the rest of the country. I mean, Kashmir is burning, so is so many other places. We should actually be able to draw parallels between our own situation and the situation of others in the country and outside the country. And the film is also supposed to let you think about some of these things. Uh, the state has acted terribly uh, during those 20 years uh, that Mizoram went through this Rambai. But the state has done terrible things in Nagaland, and in Assam, and in Manipur, and in Kashmir, and in Punjab, and so many other things, Chhattisgarh, whatever. So I mean, the thing is also to create awareness and create exposure to all of these things, and to actually talk about them, and debate about them, and bring them out as much as possible. This is just the first step you know, that people have, like, we came and we thought this was an interesting story to tell, and something that needed to be done. Like that, there are hundreds and thousands of stories, and each one of them is very, very important. Yeah, and if I might just add to them, I think uh, this is, in our view, this is just the beginning. There should be many more films. There should be many more stories. There must be many more books. All of you should be able to tell these stories, talk to your parents. You know, the time for silencing is over. The time for dialogue, for conversation, and for these 
ideas coming out and filling up spaces is, is now. And you have to do it. It's not our job to do it anymore. It's younger people have to take it forward. I mean, the Vice Chancellor shared his story. The head of the Department of Economics shared his. I'm sure like that there are so many others. Yes, sir. That was, that was just an introduction about just an introduction. The real suffering was not repeated at all. Yeah, that's because, you know, in a documentary film, you have the advantage or disadvantage of working with the material that you have. And in a, in a film, ultimately, you know, whoever spoke to us spoke out of a sense of trust. And that is a huge responsibility on us, that they spoke to us because they believed what we were doing was the right thing to do. And there will be many more stories, I'm sure, which need to be told and many more films which must be made. This is just an attempt to break ground and open the space. Okay, okay that, that was good. Because uh, I congratulate you for this, but I think this is just a preliminary exercise for the whole Ramboy. Okay, and so but that arouse our sentiment. And so the real suffering and then, uh, you know, the condition, the real condition of the people of Mizoram at that time was not depicted at all. And so, if another series is coming up, that will be very good. And so, we will appreciate that kind of, uh, you know, uh, exercise. Well, like as in as Preeti and I both have said, you know, these are stories that need to come from you. We can come and we can document and we can share. This is an effort to help people understand that this, the younger generation here perhaps never heard of these voices. How many of you have heard the chief minister that he was handcuffed, kept in chains, thrown in a prison? He has never said this in public. You know, the other people who have spoken, who have spoken, as I said, out of a sense of trust. So please don't say that we have not depicted the thing. We have tried our best in the limitations of budget, time and personnel to do what we can. This is the beginning. Yes. It is up to all of you to take the story forward. For that, we congratulate you for that. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. like uh, 50, after 50 years, of course, we can say something about the, you know, the real yeah, suffering what, of the what people. What surprises me, no, that was again, one thing, is that why do we have to make this film? It should have come from here. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. It is now your story and you've got to run with it. I mean, I, I'd say that like the first time I went to a village just outside of Aizol, that was my right. first trip to Mizoram and first trip to a village here. And there was a gathering of maybe 25, 30 people there and we had our translator with us. And the first question that came to my mind and which I asked was whether have you told this story to your children and your grandchildren? And none of those people had talked about it. I am a second generation partition survivor. Okay, my, my mother's side of the family came from Pakistan. I have grown up on these stories. I have learned these stories and heard these stories. My entire family is writing a family memoir in which we are writing the stories that we have heard of our family. So you need to do that. You need to talk. And this was just supposed to be, you know, setting the ball rolling. Okay, good, that's good. Good afternoon. And my question is uh, to Ms. Gill. Uh, you are saying that you have been traveling the, the whole of Northeast for 15 to 20 years. And my question is that uh, we never compared the MNF movement with other insurgency in Northeast State. What do you think of the MNF movement relating to other movements of Northeast India like NSCI, IM of uh, Nagaland, Alpha, and all like that? How do you think of the MNF movement relating to those insurgencies? In many ways, I guess they would be similar. At least they begin with some kind of ideology and an idealism among the youth to try and get a better deal for themselves, a better life, look for independence, looking for freedom. But then I think at the end of it, everybody makes a deal because everybody then succumbs to what is, you know, whether it's a commercial interest or whether it's some other kind of interest. And some of that was also hinted at in the documentary that you saw. So things then sort of petter out and, you know, 
go wrong. So uh, there are things that are similar and things that are very, very unsimilar. So at least in, in Mizoram, once that peace accord was signed, there has been peace. In many other states in the Northeast, I think, you know, I mean, it hasn't happened like that. So um, there are similarities and there are differences. Uh, let me clear up my questions. Uh, my, my central idea is that, do you think any superiority or any speciality of the MRF movement relating to other, those insurgencies? Superiority, yeah, don't no, know. I don't think so. I think that uh, okay, I, then, yeah, I think uh, after some time, you know, you have uh, after 15, 20 years, you know, other issues take over in movements. You know, movements have to sustain themselves. They have to raise money. They charge. They, you know, some people call it extortion. Other people call it taxation. That becomes a very major issue in places like Manipur and, and Nagaland and even in parts of Assam. Uh, in Mizoram too, that was a bit of a, that was an issue. But I think that in, in all these cases, there comes a time when several things come together. You know, the fatigue, you know, essentially the MNF movement, the Naga movement and now what you're seeing in Manipur is falling or failing or slowing and faltering because of public fatigue. People are tired of it all. They want to live what they don't know, a normal life, quote, whatever normal means, you know. And that is very important to recognize. Young people, whether it's from Mizoram, Nagaland, Manipur, Assam, elsewhere are moving out to other parts of India where their parents their parents and grandparents may have fought against the idea of India. But now many people from this part of the world are engaging with that on a daily basis. They may face discrimination, they may face problems, but they are going ahead with that. And they are much more robust than the earlier generation of the 70s and 80s. Because now you cannot discriminate against a person from the Northeast without an issue becoming a public problem and a challenge and police uh, and the media and the police, uh, you know, taking uh, cognizance of it. So I think this is very important for us to, to recognize that the, we are talking about it this morning, that the whole engagement between uh, the Northeast and the rest of India, New Delhi is changing and it's being driven by younger people that change because not just with political engagement, but by the fact that they are moving. They're in your face. You have to recognize that they will speak up and they will share the stories. I think this is a remarkable thing. You know, um, migration, movements, and often people vote, I'm fond of this phrase, people vote with their feet. They move, they tell their stories. They engage, and I think that's the future of partly, you know, the future of our region in that. Um, I'm from the Department of Psychology, and yes. I would just like to make a comment, an elaboration, actually. Um, I, when the el elderly woman was talking about her new rape experience, and the people in the back were laughing. I seriously did not get that because, and I am deeply ashamed as a woman, I do not understand how people could laugh at those, at those incidents. I, I, maybe the woman did not, um, maybe the woman did not, uh, did not tell her story the way she meant to. It was probably funny in a way, but I don't think as Mizos we should have been laughing at all. This is our history. I seriously don't think this is a joke. And also, I would just like to point out how much of an enlightenment we need of the events of the 60s as youths. We, we have to be enlightenment we have to be enlightened of these events because those events we we come from those events 
from those events make us. And I don't think we really should be laughing about it at all and we should be ashamed. Even as humans, we should be ashamed, not just as measles, we shouldn't have left. And um, I think also that was a really great, um, not great, but that was a really good uh, example of how much sensitization we need of those events and also for our lack of maturity and sensitivity. I would really like to apologize for the masses. Thank you. I think we can have uh, more questions from the students, and after that you can proceed for your light refreshment. And the special invitees and faculty uh, questions will be after the students, okay? So any more questions? Please raise your hand. Hello. Hi, I'm from, I mean, I'm Judith from Mascom department. Uh, I have no comments or questions to ask, but I would like to say thank you for such a wonderful uh, documentary. As a Mizo girl, uh, as a young Mizo girl, I've never been told in my life of such a history of how the, how the, our politi political leaders have sacrificed their life for our future. And despite of them not being here with us anymore, I'd like to say in front of all these heads, a thank you, a thousand thank you. It is because of their sacrifices that we live our life today. And I think that, I think that about the decision making by our late beloved Chief Minister Naldena, I think it was one of the most remarkable and the most righteous decision made in Mizo history. Because it is because of the decision made that we are a proud Indian, and I'm proud to be one of the Indian. This generation, we are able to live, because of that decision, we are able to live with the full rights, full freedom, and I'm thankful for that. And thank you to both of you for a wonderful documentary, for all the efforts that you put through. And this will be, a, this is like the first step for all this generation, like, this documentary itself is a voice for those people who have sacrificed their lives. As generation pass, uh, as generation pass by, the next generation comes up. This documentary is going to be a voice saying that um, they have sacrificed their life for our future. Their life for our future. I mean, thank you. Sir, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Benjamin here from the University of Calcutta. Uh, in much appreciation, I came here. I came by to attend the program in much, in much appreciation of your initiative. All right. I just want to make a quick, uh, quick viewpoint uh, regarding the context of uh, regarding, regarding this documentary and the whole scenario of the uh, history of the Rambo. All right. So, um, so my first question is that the, the complexities of corroborating authentic uh, history from Ramboy. So, I, I, I like to add more few comments that it is very difficult to corroborate the authentic question, uh, authentic uh, history regarding this because uh, in this um, scenario there is a tussle of or there is a talk of war between the you know the defect where the political parties have a uh, you know a conflicting version so how can we corroborate the actual the factual and uh, the factual and authentic questions based uh, uh, regarding this uh, history of Ramboisa? how can we corroborate the actual and the factual and the authentic history of this Ramboisa? I think there is scope, as I said at the beginning, for many, many films and many, many stories and many, many books. The only authentication you will get is from truth-seeking and truth-telling. And people who have lived through that kind of violence will not tell a lie. You know, you can 
go to a village and hear a story, 50 years later it is still a life memory for them. As it is in Manipur, as it is in Nagaland, and to a lesser degree as it is in parts of Assam. And I think it is we who have to be much more <coughs> honest and understanding in our comprehension of the of the issue and the problem because we cannot go with a preset idea. You can go with preset questions, but when people tell the stories, we must have the patience to listen to them because often, whether it's in Mizoram or Nagaland, the story does not come out until a person really trusts you. So you have to go back time and again. So it's a very patient, like if you talk to the Department of Psychology mm -hmm. and they have actually worked on the Rombai, you have a rich repository in the university of people who worked on the Rombai years. Uh, Professor Fente and her colleagues, the head of department, they've actually studied this have conducted scores, if not hundreds of interviews, and have presented this work in the country, in the university, I'm sure, and abroad. So um, I think it is a combination of patience, of being open, and be ready to be wrong. You know, we do not go in with a preset idea that this is the story. We go in with the idea is that we don't know the story. We are here to learn and to hear. So, and that's the same thing that we did in Nagaland and Mizoram on an earlier film, which is called uh, 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 Measure of Impunity, because that was the impact of conflict on women. It is much more focused on women and the stories, the horror that they went through. And, you know, uh, many nights we couldn't sleep after listening to those stories. Because um, these are people who've never told their stories to even <coughs> members of their own family. So what happens when they trust you with the biggest secret of their lives, which they've kept from their children and their husbands or whoever it is, for the last 40, 50 years? It's a huge responsibility, you know? And we have to accept that responsibility, although you're not trained for the job, you have to become caregivers because there's nobody else to do it. So, you know, when we do these kind of things, they're not projects. You're dealing as humans with fellow humans. You're telling their story. You're not using them to tell your story. You know? So, I think that that needs to be very clear. Um, hello, uh, my name is Rosang Zodi Tsongto from the Department of Management and uh, we have not been informed of this Ramboy uh, since youth, since our young age and um, all we know is from these old chaps from social gatherings and I have been in very interested since then. I kept asking these old people of uh, what actually happened but they don't really give me the answer I wanted, so I would like I like to ask you one question. Um, aside from Ramboy literature that has been published by Dr. O Op Avancio, uh, there has hardly been notions of how the women were raped, how many families were tortured by the underground themselves, the, the Mizo underground themselves. Apart from the two officers that talked righteously of what happened, do you think they are still living out? some parts out, leaving out some parts that we, we know will what happened but went silent. Do you think the people you, intervie you interviewed were still biased in some ways? Uh, I think that the people that we interviewed uh, told their stories as best that they could tell them. There must have been stuff that they didn't tell us. There may have been things that they kept back or that was very difficult for them to speak about and they still couldn't say it. And that's certainly a possibility. But um, we tried to get in as many different uh, texts also. So there's the main thread of the Rambai and the trouble that happened and the history of that trouble briefly told through the film. But apart from that, we are also trying to uh, bring in questions that 
should be raised. One being, you know, when that young man says that the government of India should apologize. It's just one line in the film, but it, it's a question. Another time when one of those young women says that it's a, it's a contrived piece. So you've actually managed to conceal everything or you've, you know, pulled a shutter down on bad memories and you think that you are peaceful. So do you need to raise that shutter and look at all those monsters which are inside? That's also a question. So in that way, we've just tried to leave many, many questions which we cannot answer, obviously. There are things that people will have to think about and it's not going to end today or tomorrow or the day after. These are things that will keep happening. It's not that, you know, I mean, like I said, it's happening in Kashmir every single day. You're reading it in the paper. So it's not something that's going to go away. But we need to raise the questions anyway. And right at the end also when, when uh, that young woman, she says something about finding closure and finding, you know, I mean, so do you have to, there is the aspirational young person who wants to find a job, a career, a life. So you leave all these things behind and you look forward and you try and find that. But can you actually do that without acknowledging the history that you've inherited? So these are all the kind of troubling things that all of us have, you know. So I'm a Punjabi, I know what happened in Punjab during all those years. Uh, I know that my family went through 1984 when the Sardars were killed in New Delhi. I mean, so all of us have got these histories, we've all got all these traumas, but we need to bring them out time, from time to time and think about them and question them. So that's what the film was trying to do really. Not give you all the answers, but raise uncomfortable questions. That's it. Uh, sir, ma'am, uh, thank you for uh, making this wonderful documentary. And I think I speak for the whole people in this room when I say, like, we appreciate what you have brought here to us. And uh, I'm from Department of Mass Communication. I'm a guest faculty there. And I've heard stories from my, from my parents, both my mother and father, and uh, a few other people of, you know, stories that, that, that uh, like, kind of the, the things that happened to them during this uh, Rambo incident. And it's... Being from a mass communication background, I, I've always had this interest to, like, if I, I said, like, if I ha ever made, like, a documentary film, this would be the kind of documentary that I've made. And having said that, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, during the entire production process, which part was the most difficult kind of, what, what kind of issues did you uh, encounter? <laughs> I think the most difficult thing was uh, how to make a film in 45 minutes and tell this very challenging, difficult story and be sensitive to every person that we interviewed and to the larger context, the issues, you know. We could not uh, uh, bring in every interview. I mean, a documentary by its very nature, uh, you know, some of you may have questions about what was left in or what is inside and what is out. Sometimes what is left out is hinted at or reflected upon. I think the young lady who asked the question about, uh, I think I don't have attention right now. Uh, I think you asked that question about uh, whether people were prejudiced in the film and all that, you know, who we interviewed. I think often the filmmaker, say I'm the producer, ultimately the filmmaker is the director, and the editor. We can write a script, we can develop the ideas, but ultimately the art of the film is that I can't, I don't know how to film, I don't know how to direct, I can give ideas and discuss them with my director. And he believes in nuancing, not in, there are some documentaries who, makers who are in your face, you know, it's like this and this and this, and he's not like that, and I have to respect that, you know. And what is not there, it is also for the audience to find out. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. There's. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yes. Hello. I came for the documentary premiere yesterday, but uh, today again I decided to come because of two reasons. One, uh, one of the main reasons was that we'll be here. Uh, premiering in front of a young crowd and I just wanted to see the effect it would have on them. And I'm really glad to see the kind of effect it actually had. 
And I totally agree with uh, Mr. Sanji when he says that now he's set the ball rolling. And I'm sure that now the next step is for us, the youth, to take action and see where and how far we can go uh, with regard to the Ramboai and what our history is all about. And also last night after the premiere, uh, it got me thinking and I had um, messaged a couple of my friends, uh, outstationed friends, because this project, I know you all have been working on it for a number, uh, two years plus or so, and I have been talking about it to my friends. And so I told them the project is finally done and we got to watch the premiere and the book was released so and so. It seems that the non-local friends are more excited about the project and the fact that it's done. And now they are wanting to know when and where they will be able to watch it mainly on mainstream media or if not where and where, in which cities they will be able to come and uh, maybe watch the screen you know, this kind of thing. Is there a way that I can convey to them the message? Yeah, what I think we need to do is probably start a Facebook uh, account for the film. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, advertise the screenings as, because tomorrow we're going to Lung Lake, the screening at 7 tomorrow in the evening. Uh, then on the 20th of October, I think it is, we are screening in Guwahati. We will be screening on the 22nd in Gangtok of November. And, you know, the whole long, uh, on Delhi also is scheduled next month. We are still waiting for our date. Uh, and it will be screened in different parts of the world. We hope to go through the film festival circuit also and see wherever it's accepted, we'll screen it there. So, we will try and do this. I think Nefu is very good at this sort of thing. So we will try and develop that as a, a Facebook account. Or, yeah, I don't want to much. put it on YouTube right here, right now. Uh, perhaps uh, in a few months, once it, we are sure about the film festival thing. Oh, hello, sir. Right here in the back. Right here in the back. Uh, first of all, I want you say thank you for coming and showing us this documentary but as I have always does I like to criticize some points because first of all uh, it was annoying to watch the transaction that, uh, first of all, <coughs> uh, I'm a student of mass communication as a student of mass communication I think I should be saying this because uh, first of all it was annoying to watch between the transaction of the videos uh, it was all those FX use was quite annoying to see and then secondly the subtitle was very hard to see because usually most of the background were white and the and the subtitles were also white so it's very difficult to see a white and a white and then thirdly uh, uh, the audios the audios could have been a lot uh, compressed because sometimes the levels were too high and it was hard to hear and Sometimes they were too low, so I think that there should be a normalization, more of that. And then I have this, I have one question is that uh, one of the heads of the MNF party who is still alive is Zoram Tangen. He was not included in the video, so uh, I have a question for that. Yeah, on, on uh, your uh, question about the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, technical thing, you know, we were f filming in very difficult conditions. There were, these were not airtight studios, or soundproof studios, we were shooting in people's homes with the cicadas and the rain coming down. There's a, and if you remove completely the ambient sound, there'll be a, a completely loss of, of, of character in that whole thing, you know. And as far as uh, the MNF leadership is concerned, if you have noticed the flow of the film, we have included all those who are actually involved in the events. You know, we f focused on the cadres and, and, and some of the leaders. And those who had, we thought, had extremely compelling stories to tell. Uh, it is not difficult, it is not easy to include everybody in this. You know? So yes, so, I, I know. And, 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 and I think that you know this is something that you guys need to 
move on and take on from from here you know make a better film yeah uh, there's already one film made by an invisible person his name is napoleon yeah i know napoleon He's yeah the, for the films division the 26 minute film on the mnf yeah also and then uh, do you have any contact with him about him or he came to, he came to the film yesterday okay i've been in touch with him Okay, thank you. I see that thing. I think the other thing over here. The other thing uh, over here was also that uh, it was certainly telling that story. Like I said earlier, also you're certainly telling that story of those twenty years, but you're also trying to move beyond it. So that is why you have all these young people asking all these questions. So you're not trying to leave the story in the past, but you're also trying to connect it to what is Mizoram today. You know, so it's like trying to also bring in bring in some of the newer things. So there is, you know, you do see, do see uh, there was some line about it's a very equitable society for women. There was another line about, you know, Swachh Bharat campaign, something like that. So they were, they were trying, you know, we were also trying to make connections uh, with other things and to bring it up to date to what is going on now and what what is Mizoram all about or what the youth of Mizoram is expecting to be now. And also that when you take this film out, because I'm really happy because all of you have got all these comments to make over here, but when you take the film out of Mizoram and other people watch it, they need to also have those little windows through which they will see a culture which they do not know anything about. So you need to provide those little, little windows. So if you are concentrating too much, and it's not meant to be a political film anyway. So if you're concentrating too much only on that one thing which other people don't know anything about, you cannot fill them up with information only on one thing. So you need to actually like spread it out, which is what, you know, I mean, maybe it went wrong, but that was the, that was the idea. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I have one question. Maybe it's not question, it's a self-analysis. There is always a question that we, Nordic peoples, are neglected. See, now the customary people are suffering. If we are not put up our voice in regards to Kashmiri peoples, then how we accept and how we think that they would put our voice, put our real things in the mainland areas or in their issues? That's a comment. It's like self analyzing ourselves question then how we think that if we are not aware about the, the surroundings that the now Kashmiri peoples are suffering, if we are not aware and if you are not questioning about the, these things, then it is our wrong point or our right point that we think that they would put our voice in the play. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we need to, you know, understand the pain of others. That's why I think Riti spoke about it earlier and I mentioned it, that we have to understand, you know, relate what we go through with what is happening in other parts of the region and other parts of the country and the world. Only then, you know, your uh, 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 global society really uh, is, is connected in a way by this arc of pain. Um, and what has been suffered here is unique in some ways, but other people are also going through the uh, similar turmoil even, even today. So we need to be cognizant of that and sensitive to it. I think that is... An, Try and understand it better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Take one more question and then. Sir, Madam, thank you for showing us such a wonderful documentary. I think it inspires us a lot. My name is Peter. I'm from Science Department, uh, third semester. What I want to, uh, it's not exactly a question, I want to express one thing which they in my mind since a very long period of time. When, uh, when people talk, when I heard people talk about Aram Boy issue or uh, insurgency period. See, if we take a look at the mainland India, there are certain areas affected by insurgents and separatist movement. One big example, which we all know, is the Naxalites movement. It's been a long time since the Naxal movement or the Maoist insurgency affected some states, not only a single state, but till today, we have not heard whether Indian army have been deployed there or not, or the jet fighters have been used. It's been uh, in, in Mizoram, if we, if we look at our history, if our state capital, Aizawa, has been attacked by jet fighter. So what I want to say here is that it doesn't mean that I want to, uh, like, 
it doesn't mean that I want to like raise the sentiments of the Muslims to against India. But I'm Muslim. I love being Indian Muslim. I, I want to convey that. But do you think this is no? L let's do it this way. So do you have anything to say on this issue? Because our state capital has been attacked by but I think I Indian Air Force. Clear, if I may interrupt you, I made that very clear at the beginning. I've said this as public forums all across the country to the army, to the government, whoever cares to listen, is that uh, we, the government of India owes the Mizos an apology for that incident. The apology is not coming. I can't be apologized on behalf of the government because I'm never part of the government. But I think one of the things that should be done is repeal the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. That's been my position for a pretty long time. I've been on the Justice Ready Committee which uh, reviewed the Act and recommended the repeal. The government hasn't made the report public, but you can read it on the Hindu website, if anybody wants to read it. And, you know, it is not one incident. It is not one event. It is not one people. It is not one state. It is the context in which all these things happen. And the context is the fact that you have an act which is oppressive, which promotes injustice and it promotes impunity and inequality. You cannot have that in a democracy. And that is the bottom line. Thank you.